Welcome to the Recruiter Startup Podcast. My name is Dolta Doherty and in this podcast series, I will be talking to investors, advisors, entrepreneurs and recruiters who are based all over the world and we will be discussing how to set up, operate and scale a world-class recruitment company. Today I have the man, the myth, the legend, David Stevens Patterson on the podcast or DSP as he's known in the industry. He runs the Herc Facebook group and is a practicing recruiter and has a coaching business for independent recruiters as well. I've had him on the podcast before, but I wanted to bring him back on and really just get into the specifics of how somebody sets up a recruitment business from scratch. And we went through all the points that you need to take into consideration um, or most of them anyway as much as we could do within uh, within the 40 minutes um, really knowledgeable guy I've learned a lot following him and I hope you do too hope you're all excited about the weekend and winding down a bit getting into that Christmas spirit so we'll all be pumped up and ready to go again in the new year and maybe you might be able to implement some of the things that David's talking about. David Stephen Patterson, how are you? What is up, man? I am doing absolutely fantastic. How are you doing? DSP himself. Your oh, boy DSP coming at you live. <laughs> good man so you're a, you're very chipper today that's great considering you've, you're probably not getting a lot a lot of sleep how's the how's the latest arrival to the dsp clan actually the latest dsp arrival uh her name is uh, isabella or as i call her izzy pop also we call her squishy squish face all of, well, derivatives of squish but uh no it's doing great actually uh fortunately uh, Elisa is waking up at night with her because I get up at 4 a.m. every morning. So because I get up so early and she runs for a business, but she gets to sleep in. She wakes up at night. I get a full five and a half hour sleep. And then I'm up at four o'clock. So 5 a.m. Uh, are are, are, are you there. doing the rock workout then? Is that is that what's up? I wish, man. It's a lot of work. Although I do, I do a lot of the uh, the Wim Hof breathing techniques in the morning. I do like you know ice baths and all that. So that I do do. Uh, but no, I'm not as as uh, uh, as gifted athletically as the Rock, unfortunately. Wow. Okay. Cool. So we've had we've had you on before, and I had car alarms going off in the background, and uh, the sound quality just wasn't great. So I had to get you back on. Um, if anybody wants to figure out more about David, we've done a we've done a good one before, so jump back to a previous episode and have a listen. And um, today we're going to cover some specifics. Um, David has access to lots and lots of independent recruiters, and does a lot of coaching and guiding in how they can set up their business uh, to be successful. So I wanted to jump into that today. Um, so. How will we start, David? What What's the most important thing when somebody's thinking of setting up? And take into account just from a, from a business strategic perspective, not an administration one. Okay. Well, first off, um, uh, I'll tell you other things that stop a person from going into business is them thinking about the them thinking about having to or, or, or the the stories you tell yourself. I need to know how to start a business. I need to be prepared. I need a, I need a, a fucking business plan. Excuse me, my French. I need a business plan. I need this. I need this. I need this. I need this, right? And it's all those things that it, it's your ego basically getting in the way saying, look, we don't want you to change who you are. Who you are, right, is, is good with us. We're, we're afraid of failure. And it's that reptile brain in your head, that fear, you know, uh, 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 spinal um, uh, uh, piece of your brain that's basically telling you why not to go in business and giving you every excuse in the book why not to. So I think really before you do anything else, you have to be mentally prepared to be in the right mindset to to go in. People try to be perfect. People try to get everything ready just, just right. And done is better than perfect. 
And so I think the, the mindset really more than anything else is critically important before you really get into the, uh, the actual tactics of starting the business. Do you think it's easier maybe if you have a lot of experience? If, if that's uh, the case? Actually, sometimes that could be, uh, that, that can hurt you, right? If you've spent the last 15 years in a search firm doing that, you've got a lot of momentum holding you back. When I started my, when I, when I first went independent, uh, I had worked for MRI for about two years and, uh, and that was about it. And, and candidly, I, I wish I would have gone earlier, but I think sometimes it's the, it's that, this that momentum, or really, I guess I should, I should say inertia that holds you back. So, um, and, and also when you're more experienced, sometimes you, you realize all the things that could go wrong, uh, Ignorance is sometimes a bliss, and you, you need that sort of childlike curiosity, and and uh, maybe a little bit of the uh, naivete to actually make the leap and do it. Sure. Okay. But obviously, we need a bit of strategic planning. To have oh, sure. Some, yeah. some sort of of, that. So, <laughs> of course, of course, so yeah. Without without having uh, Bob off the street, just jump into setting up a recruitment practice. What are the? What would you say? is step one outside of getting your mental side side right sure uh, step one would be talking to people in that industry so there's a lot of what i call mental masturbation in the business where uh you sit down you think and you strategize and say well i think cybersecurity. yes cybersecurity. that's the hot market right now i'm going to work with that and here's the and 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 then this will be my core differentiator and this will be my, my, my positioning and here's my messaging. Yet they've never talked to a single prospective candidate. They never talked to a single prospective client. They never talked to anybody. And so really, you know, if you're looking to start in any niche, one of the very first things I would do beyond just getting your, your LinkedIn profile set up and maybe like a basic website is really go out there and, and start talking to people in the, in the industry and not to plug my own crap, but uh, if you were to down, uh, to look at the five day hire, man hire manager messaging challenge that I have in the Herc, uh, which is free, by the way, it's one of the most effective ways to get on the phone with a lot of hiring managers very, very quickly just to pick their brains about the industry. And that's the very first thing I would do because you have to figure out you know, what they want. Uh, and, and that's, uh, for anybody listening, the Herc is David's uh, Facebook group. How, how many me members do you have now? Uh, we're coming up on 4,000 and I, and, and here's, here's the funny thing. I actually decline about 60 to 70% of the people that apply. So, uh, I do have, you know, they're too ugly? People walk. exactly. Yeah. Only no ugly people, people, only beautiful yeah. people, right? <laughs> only beautiful people. Yeah. No, but, but people who aren't, aren't recruiters. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but if they're, if they're not, if they're not recruiters, or at least in the recruitment industry, at least one, you become a recruiter. I'm not going to let him in. So I'm trying to keep all the uh, spammers out. Some do, some do slip through. Yeah. We do. I refuse a lot. Yeah. Look, software salespeople in recruitment groups really grind my gears because it's just everything's leading into them pitching you the whole time when, when really, okay, we, we know what your product does. I don't need to hear about it every time. Mm -hmm. Very, right. true. Very true. So that's my little rant over. Right. So, Enough. We're having Fair a we're, we're having a bit of a chat with people in the industry, getting getting into their mind's eye and to what's uh, what's happening, figuring out you know maybe what type of things that you're going to focus on within that. What's the next stage that uh, that like what does that lead to essentially? Okay, so what that leads to is this, uh, and I'm about to use a a, a word that I hate absolutely hate but i'm still going to use it anyway just because it's the best word i can use and that is the figuring out your client avatar i hate the word avatar i think it's so douchey I, but it's, you need a new word that, for that brother i need a new word i do need a new word but and for lack of a better word i will go with the avatar i don't like the word profile either um but really in essence you got to figure out who uh who your client is but not only that right because people don't think of a, a profile or after, after they think, well, it's a middle-aged man uh, in his 50s who's a CFO for a mid-sized mid-market company in the Midwest, and that's so well and good. I'm talking about the, 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 the things that that CFO says to his or her spouse at 11 o'clock 
uh, on a Sunday night when they're lying awake in bed, can't go to sleep, worried about the next day, you know, worried about the numbers, and they're in a, and they're they're in a moment of, of vulnerability. Hey, baby. <laughs> Speed, yeah. <laughs> or hey, yeah. but but you know, when they're in a moment of vulnerability, and they're like, I don't know what to do, right? That is that is that language we got to figure out. Um, because that's how we're going to speak to our audience because, and this, I might be going ahead of here, but it really kind of ties into, into this step. One thing we have to realize in our business, and it's one, it's a realization I've come to really fairly recently too, is that we're in the business of transformation. You know, we're trying to, to place people, right? But the, all of our clients, they're people, they want to advance most of them, or they want to self-actualize. They want to do a good job or make good money or get their promotion or whatever it is. Right. And the number one way to get there is having great people underneath them. Right. They say sure. hire people smarter than yourself. It's, it's cliche for a reason. Well, you know, if, if they're looking to do that and they need top performers to do that yet, you know, half of all hires or miss hires and the numbers bear this out. There are multiple studies that show this and the ones that do work out. Most of them are kind of average and not super awesome. They wouldn't rehire them if given the chance. Well, something's really wrong with, with, with their hiring and it's, and it's derailing their careers. And it's pain. Like, you know, when I ask my, my, my clients, I say, well, what, what pains do you solve? Cause you got to figure that out first, right? What pains are you solving? And they say, well, they can't find the right talent. Or, yeah, it takes a long to fill a position. Or, yeah, like that time to fill isn't, isn't the pain. The pain is having to walk into your boss's office for the, to explain the project's why, not gonna you, work. why you missed plan. Yeah, why you missed plan third quarter in a row. You might not walk out of there with a job. And you're mortgaged to the gills. You can't afford two months without a paycheck. And you're like thinking, fuck, what do I do? So sorry. And my recruiters can meet people. Sorry, go down on a tangent. But that's the... Is the so is the, is the avatar having an intrinsic understanding of your client and find and knowing where their pain point is. Is that what, is that what I'm surmising from that? It is. It's, it's figuring what their pain point is and also figuring out what their misconceptions are about how to solve that problem. Yeah. Because if they knew how to solve the problem, then they would need what we have to offer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. So that is almost in marketing terms, positioning yourself in mm -hmm. in the market isn't it uh it's the start of it yes yeah, not it's not the complete completely how to, how to position yourself but that's the beginning okay that's, where, that's the starting point all right so we've got our mindset right we're communicating with uh with people in the market we're using that to kind of understand who the client is where their pain point is mm -hmm. Are we at a stage where we're mapping out the market yet, or when does that Actually, come in? Yeah, so that was going to be my next topic. So while you're doing this, so there's, there's really multiple things you'd be doing simultaneously uh, in all of this, right? So you're out there talking to people, and of course, again, you don't want to be just be be uh, stuck in in that mode all the time. So yes, you want to map the market. I mean, and, and really mapping the market is really super easy. I mean, it's quite literally LinkedIn and Duck Soup is going to get you eighty percent of the way there. Yeah. In fact, when you use Duck Soup uh, and, and your, your first three connections, although I know the issues right now with downloading those, and there's a couple of workarounds, but when it comes to Duck Soup and LinkedIn, right? So you can quite literally, and this is what I, I do, you know, I, I'll, I'll map out. Uh, so, so, for example, I might map out candidates, uh, but I would say you first want to start on mapping clients. Uh, DuckSoup primarily gets personal email addresses for the most part. And on DuckSoup, you'll get about maybe 70% of the hit rate on emails, meaning some of the emails are going to be blank. A couple are going to be work emails, most personal. Give that to a VA and get a service like Voila Norbert to basically fill in the blanks. Yeah. Hey, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a personal, get me a work. If it's a work, get me a personal, fill in the blanks. Because one of the biggest advantages we have is when you can tell a, a client Right, we we've mapped out X amount percent of the market. Like I can literally say, hey, for this director of OCM, there's 312 people in the southeast, and here's their profile. This is gonna look like. Here's a plan to attack it. As opposed to most recruiters, they say, oh yeah, yeah, I can find somebody. Got that right. Let me. Yeah, let, I, mean, let, yeah. I think we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. Now, sure. In mapping out the marketplace, how are we deciding who the clients are? How are we picking the location? How are we picking the industry? How are we picking the job types within the industry? 
Gotcha. Um, well, candidly, that just comes down to a little bit of research on the front end, right? Seeing, you know, what, what are the firms are out there? If, yeah, if there is an industry where there is a, a, a decent amount of search traffic, of search uh, business, you know, that's, that means there's business out there with companies willing to pay a fee. I'm not a big believer in the fact that things are a red, a red ocean. You can make a blue ocean out of a red ocean pretty easily just with a few tweaks. So go out there and see where search activity is. Are, are there firms out there posting positions? Uh, are there recruiters actually working? And also, again, talking to your, your prospects or your, your potential clients, asking them, what recruiters are you using? What, what, uh, you know, why do you use recruiters? How often do you use recruiters? So a lot of that comes down to the, the, the front end of research, but also in the conversations you're having with your prospects. And, and, when, but, and when we're narrowing down, are, are you doing it by industry? Are you doing it by location? Well, I use in this and and this I, I I stole from one of my mentors, Jeff K, in the business. So this is not my concept, but we're all, I go we're by all the in the business method. of stealing here. Yeah, exactly uh, by uh, the fill methodology, F I L L, function, industry, location, level. So it's not just industry, right? For me, I, I recruit SAP. I guess you can say it's an industry, but my clients are in manufacturing, finance. Uh, 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 insurance and uh, advertising, et cetera. So there's no you know, biotech or pharmaceutical. So I cut across industries, but it's the function and more kind of like the location that I, that I specialize in. Others might be industry and level specific. So it depends on uh, how you want, there's really these four areas you can define any niche and those four areas, function, industry, location, and level. All right, how narrow would you go on that? Because um, I think a lot of people, when they're when they're setting out their plan, they can mm-hmm. almost plan for take for world domination before they realize that they're too far, there's too much on their yeah. plate, and they're kind of getting lost in their own web. So for me now, now when I went through some numbers here, and, and for everybody it's going to be different. I just know uh, from my experience, a great sweet spot is you know for for decision makers having between. Two to five thousand, probably no more than that. I would say no less than that. Again, you know, there are obviously exceptions to to every rule, but I would say somewhere in that range because you don't the, the especially if you're advertising online, you need social media. The the the, the larger the audience, the more expensive it gets, mm. uh, and also and the more spread out you're going to be. But at the same time, you also want to make sure you've got the variety. You also want to make sure that you uh, you're working in an industry where where um, there's a lot of recyclability. So, for example, you've got a search and the results from that search can be used on a different search and a different search and a different search. So a lot of recyclability is also pretty key. Until you're moving your own market. Yes. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Okay, so that there brings, brings us to the, the point that you were making on data and collecting mm-hmm. and automating, automating that process. And I, I take it we're doing that for a reason. Well, yeah, you're doing it for a reason. I mean, uh, candidly, you're doing it to build your database. I mean, it, it's a slow burn. I mean, Duck CP might only be able to do a couple hundred, 300 a day, depending on on on, you, on how many connections you have on LinkedIn right now, how much you spend on LinkedIn. You know, the, the more you spend, the, the, the more leeway LinkedIn will give you. At least that's my uh, opinion. They won't say that, but I believe I'm right. But it, but, but regardless, it, it might you might only do three hundred a day, but if you take it over the course of six months, you can have a massive database that rival any of your competitors because they don't have the staying power of doing it every single day and just like chipping away at that rock. Yeah. So that's something that you don't do at the beginning. You, it's a continuous process, but I will start on the client side first and then candidate side. Uh, candidates are important. It's candidate driven market, definitely, but clients are the ones that pay the bills and you got to go out and get a client first in my opinion, uh, and that's where you want to, to start. Now, most of us are using databases the old way, where we're just using them to store information. I, mm-hmm. I'm guessing that a lot of your approach is about using that data to be targeted in the, the process of trying to engage with people through content. Is that right? 100%. So that's why I want my VA to go out and fill in all the holes. I, if I'm getting mostly personal, I want to get work emails, vice versa. I want both because, and phone number too. So I can, if I have all three, I've got their uh, personal, I've got their work email, and in addition to social media profile, but I can now take that 
list of personal emails and upload those to Facebook and, and run ads against that. I can take the same, those same people and use their work emails uh, and, 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 and sell to them and market to them. Or, or if I'm recruiting in that, in that space, recruiting those high level people, I can use those personal emails to go and recruit them. But I want to have all those options available um, as opposed to having maybe only one line of communication to somebody, uh, which is, is very ineffective in today's market. All right. So now we kind of are at a point where we have our go-to market strategy. Um, so I suppose content creation is the next stage, is it? Actually, no. Uh, the, the next stage is figuring out your offer. So I, the way I work is a little bit, it's, it's, it, I jump around. I think you have to figure out what the, the avatar and the pain and what they think is the problem is and what the real problem is. Because you leave, there's a gap, that's what the opportunity is and figuring out what their vision is, like what, what do they want? If you can get that figured out, go figure out what your offer is going to be. That's on the other side of the spectrum, right? The other side of the journey. Can you give us an example of what that, that would first. mean? Okay, so um, do you mind if I use an example of, of, of weight loss? Sure. Because I think that, that illustrates it pretty well. Okay, so uh, for me, if I wanted to sell somebody on my weight loss, on my, my, my DSP beach body program, right? <laughs> Do you, so, do you actually have one? <laughs> I, should, I should come out with one because I, I love this analogy. Every, um, but if, if I want to sell my DSP Beachbody program, yeah. then um, if I just go out and sell that program, it's like everybody else's. I'm, there's so much white noise. I'm not going to get through. So, which is the equivalent of me cold calling everybody. Hey, you need, you, hey, you want to lose weight? Hey, you want to lose weight? Hey, you want to lose weight? I might get a couple here and there, but it's low hanging fruit. So I got to figure out, I got to sell them first on, okay, um, um, here's the concept of, of losing weight. You gotta, you gotta lift heavy. You have to do light cardio, right? Which is people think it's all cardio and that's not the way you really should do it. Lift heavy, light cardio, good fats, low carb, right? I got to sell them on that first. Then once they buy into that, then I can say, Hey, here's my system, the beach body DSP, uh, uh, system package, whatever to get you there. Right? So in essence, for me, I want to sell my, so for me, I need to figure out, okay, what, what is my offer? You know, how can I figure out, how can I solve all those pains and problems that they have? Okay. And then how can I sell them on, okay, the underlying process beneath that offer? So I got to figure out what the offer is. Once I figure out what that offer is, and then I can work on my messaging in between. Mm. So that's the, that's the order that I go in. Is, is simply put, is the offer not the product? Um, similarly. So, I mean, I could say, hey, buy my Beachbody program. This is my system. And when you work with me, you also get this fancy T-shirt. You get three months of support. You get a, a Facebook community, right? That's, that's the offer. The product is the package. I don't want to get into do, too, much, too deep in the weeds there. But what we'll just say for now, to keep it simple, um, yeah, the, the product that you offer, the, your offer, your system, should be different than the process by which, you, by, by which they, they can hire the right talent. Right. Because the hiring the right talent comes down to going to the passive candidate marketplace um, and locking in a recruiter, one recruiter to really dive deep in there, figuring out your employer value proposition and doing this multi pronged communication strategies into the market and, and, and I mean, the whole thing. Right. From from front to back. Um, in order for you to get there, I need to get you to buy into that concept. And then I could sell you my process for or my system for doing it. I think a lot of recruiters have it backwards where they, they go in and start selling the, the, the system. Like, Hey, I can do, pa I can, I can, I recruit in passive cap marketplace and my, my proprietary process and blah, 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 blah. But our clients don't care about passive cap. They don't, they're not sold on it. I want to sell them on that first. So, so again, I want to get that pain, get the offer. And then I can figure the message in between to kind of sell them on the process to get them bought into, to my offer. If that makes sense. Mm. So, in, in, a, in a recruitment standpoint, I get a candidate, um, I, I, I do up a profile, I have a resume, I send, I send that out to, out, out to the marketplace. It, are you against that as an approach, as a first approach? Sorry, could you, could you repeat that? You send out a what? I didn't hear that. Say, that. So, I, I, you know, like a, like a send out email. So, say, say I'm a good candidate, I kind of know my niche, I know that it's the right candidate for for. For, for this for this area, everybody will want it. It fits within these parameters. I send that out to the decision makers. Is is that is that is that too much too soon? Is that like 
Is that like uh, not buying a girl a drink first or? Oh, gotcha. You know, that can work. I mean, look, I, I, that's the way I was taught when I first started with MRI. I didn't personally like it. I never did it or I did it, but uh, I quickly moved away from it because it's not my style. It does work, but you know, think about what you're, what you're basically doing then, however, is if you're doing it, you're not selling your process, you're not selling your methodology, you're not selling the system of here's how you hire the best available talent. It's simply, hey, here's a great person who's available. So you're kind of more of a candidate uh, talent agent or a broker. And in some markets, that might be the way to go. I know for I know uh, there are, are, are folks that I know in the recruitment world where they say, look, if I find the right person with this skill set, I can place them anywhere. In that case, that might be the better way to go. Most markets aren't like that. Um, and, 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 and oftentimes the problem I see with recruiters when they do that, the candidate that they're offering up is really kind of no better than any other candidate out there. And if that's your pitch, it's, you're not, it's not the best foot forward Mm. in my opinion. And, and on top of that, I'm not selling the transformation and making that hiring manager better at hiring. I think the other thing I learned, I, I remember I went from doing a lot of that in, in Australia to working for a search firm in Canada. And I, I think that there's merits to both ways, but the, the, oh, one yeah. thing, the one thing I grabbed from the, from the search firm in Canada was that if you're out there doing the value proposition first, you're able to increase your price beforehand. So I thought that was seeing that executive search process and really under the hood, there's not a tremendous amount of difference, but it's how it's presented and it allowed them to increase that percentage margin exponentially. Uh, that blew my mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very true. And, and yeah, you're right. You're not able to really differentiate a lot when you do that. It comes down to how different the candidate is. Um, and on, on top of that, so for me, I'd rather sell my methodology. I'd rather try to create such a huge gap between what every other recruiter in my market offers and what I can offer. I, I want it to be a, a no brainer because people don't like to be sold, but they love to buy. I want to create something that is that they're sold on that they want to buy. All right. So what's the next stage in the, in the, in, in, in the process? The next stage in the process is figuring out your content strategy. Okay. Figuring out the journey. All right. And th- this is a tr- this is a tricky one because not everybody's creative, you know, um, and not everybody's mind works in that way. Do you buy into the Gary V mentality of document don't create? Is that, or do you do you believe in outsourcing it, or what 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 do you think? Well, about? I- I can tell you, I don't believe. I don't believe in outsourcing it. Uh, I had a, and and so well, I'll come back to that. And with the Gary Vee philosophy, yeah, that can work. But at the same time, Gary, what Gary Vee is building, and I love Gary Vee, but Gary Vee is building that that personal brand, uh, where by your you as a recruiter, in a way, yes, you're building your personal brand, but you're selling the the, the process, the methodology, the system, making them better, selling transformation. And so the do- documenting can work and be okay if done in the right way. But I think it's better to sit down and just and really, really hone in, okay, what is going to get them from, from point A to point B to point B to point you know, D, D to, to whatever, to Z all, all the way at the end, how to get them along that journey, figure out the messaging first, and then figuring out, okay, from the omnipresent standpoint, how to get that in front of everybody. So, and then, so when it comes to content and creating your own content, if you're not, uh, if you're not uh, creative, the way I look at it is this, well, it's like a recruiter coming into a firm and saying, you know what, I'm just not good on the phone. Well, all right, we'll get better. I mean, here's the phone and you'll get better by the thousandth phone call. I think when people say they're not creative, I think it's, it's a story they tell themselves so they don't have to do it or they if they really believe it and that's okay but they haven't tried uh and they haven't tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed and, and then they get better i wasn't very good when i first started and i'm p- pretty okay now i can improve a lot but i think it's it's and, and so i had a conversation with a potential client yesterday who was so wrapped up in the fact that i wouldn't create her ads for her and and she couldn't see past the fact that the reason because she had tried other uh, uh, like Facebook advertisers, people who weren't recruiters, right? And 
and it, and she spent you know tons of money on this stuff and, and, and to her point never saw a lead and so what well, was because you're not creating and i couldn't get her off that she wanted somebody to come in and do it for her quick fix but again it's 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 very similar to our hiring managers um we can go out and find the best talent right we send them the best talent and we expect them to be able to hire effectively when when the numbers show that they can't we got to show them how they must help themselves empower themselves to do it I have to help my clients empower themselves to write their own content because otherwise, you know, the, the content writer that they hire to do it for them will not be able to speak in their client's language and won't really be able to truly really speak to their market and they'll always fail. Mm. Always. Nope. Makes sense. No, it's, it's the price you pay. Sorry. So the practice, practice makes pay. perfect. No. And, perfect. Yeah. and we discussed the last time you were on, we discussed a lot about the distribution strategy of of it maybe you could just quickly highlight that i know it's a massive topic um but i I, i'm appreciative that you're you have an appointment today as well so if we go into this this full on if you could maybe just bullet point a a, a couple of points on that sure sure okay well once you get once you figure out your messaging strategy and i can go into the the funnel maybe on, on the next call there's a whole funnel system that i use but at the end of the day uh you want to be Everywhere where your clients where your clients are at, and yes, that does include Facebook. Uh, it does include um, uh, LinkedIn. Maybe in five years, might also include Instagram. As the millennials are starting to come up and into more leadership positions, not yet, but probably at some point. You know, heck, if my if my if my clients were on Pinterest, well, I'd say, well, fuck, I guess I'm on Pinterest now. Mm. Not, but you know, I would be there if they were there. So go where they're at. So Facebook, the, the, the content, the, the ability to place content in front of the eyes, everybody else for no other recruiters are at doing it like this. It's so underpriced, under, like it's, it's, it's such a steal. Uh, LinkedIn still, I still believe in LinkedIn, it, although, it's with, although it's very busy with a lot of leg humpers, you know, recruiters, oh, it's, hey, can we meet? Hey, can we meet? Got a position? I mean, it's, it's just so much white noise, but it's still really valuable. Yeah, you said something uh, interesting uh, online the other day. You said, "You said I use, I use my advertisements differently on LinkedIn to the way I do on Facebook." And yeah. you went on to say that I don't, I don't use Facebook to hook it in for a call. Did I get that right? That that the Facebook uh, was more about reinforcing, reinforcing the brand rather than the hook. Hundred percent right. In fact, I invite anybody who's interested to go to my. Not not the date not David Seven Patterson business page, but go to the SAP Recruiter business page and, and click an in phone ad. It's on the right because I believe me, I, I practice what I preach. I'm not a trainer who says you should do this. I don't do it. Go to in phone ads, click that. You'll see my ads. And one thing you will notice on 90% of my ads on Facebook, and I run a lot, no CTAs, no call to actions whatsoever. I because again, it, it comes down to leg humping. I don't want to leg hump on Facebook when they're not in a business mind on Facebook. They're sitting on the crapper, they're in the line at the corner store, they're doing whatever and they're consuming. I want them just to consume my content and see and, and, and see my name, David Patterson, the SAP recruiter, David Patterson, the SAP recruiter, good viable content, maybe entertaining, maybe funny, maybe thought provoking, whatever. Um, so when I go to LinkedIn and 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 book a try to book a call, uh, have a LinkedIn you know, lead ad, or I even cold call, right? I even cold call, or they come to me. I mean, I don't think you need a CTA when these people are adults and they're kind of smart. If they want to use your services, it's pretty easy to find me. Mm-hmm. They're not. I'm not selling. I'm not selling blenders, you know, <laughs> uh, where there's a, like a specific. Although you, although you could person. on your body program. I yeah, my beach body program exactly. I could. <laughs> Maybe I'm in the wrong business. All right, so we have a uh, we we we've kind of just skirted on on that section. I, I appreciate it's a it's a much bigger one in the background. I'm taking it you've got messaging sequencing happening as well. Correct, correct. Um, and in messaging sequencing, by the way, people typically think of messaging sequencing when it comes to email. If, I'm sure your audience or I know you have heard of an indoctrination sequence. It's where someone downloads your thing or even just a drip campaign where you indoctrinate your audience on why they should buy your thing, why they should use your service, why you're better than everybody else. You're educating them. So I use that's why I use Facebook and LinkedIn to an extent for it is it's like an email drip on a newsfeed 
where I can make sh- I pay for access to make sure they see it as opposed to like a 10% open or an email. So, um, so really for me, yes, the messaging sequence to bring them from pain to problem to, to authority to process and that whole journey that I talk about in the Herc, uh, hashtag the Herc, cheap plug. But uh, I use Facebook and LinkedIn and email and you can even use direct mail, you can do cold calls, all that. But I want kind of this multi-pronged system so that no matter where they turn, you're there tactfully. Mm. Not 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 leg humping, right? But you're giving, 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 and you can do it for really cheap. That's the crazy thing. Mm. That's what people don't realize. So, so I've, I've I've gone through a virtual assistant process on the podcast before, and I'll probably go into a bit more detail on it again. But what you've just described, if you add that to a VA, a good VA system, the the delivery and operations of a recruitment firm can be automated quite a lot. So we don't, you're, especially if you map it out properly like that. Yeah. What, what other things do we need to consider now that we've kind of done the full loop here? Uh, well, the, the one thing I will say uh, to go along with that is the fact that, so we talked about figuring your avatar and, and getting your offer right, and obviously getting your head right, and mapping your market and, and figuring the messaging sequence and all that, right? But at the end of the day, you know, no matter how good your marketing is, unless you're on the phone pitching your offer, it doesn't matter because you got to be flawless. You got to be a flawless executor on the phone. So um, that's the one thing I, I, I want to stress is during this, when you're mapping and you know, when you're figuring your messaging strategy, the entire time when you're getting on the phone with people, at first you want to have an offer. That's cool. Right, just ask them about their pains and try to get that information on, on the market. As you start to crystallize your offer, start validating it, offering it, diagnosing the pains, and the calls are going to suck really bad. You're not going to be very good. So eventually, you'll suck less. Eventually, suck less until you kind of get decent, and then you're good, and then you're really good. But um, you need to be uh, get on sales calls and 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 putting this in front of decision makers a lot, and that's a big piece. Again. I think people get too involved in the mental masturbation piece of just getting all the pieces in place and the strategy and yada, 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 but there's no boots on the ground in the field validating this stuff to field test it. And that's a big part of it too. And, and also when in the first 20 people don't want your offer, don't get discouraged. You just don't know how to pitch it yet. You know, and then, and then eventually you'll get better. And that's the thing I want to stress is that you got to make sure you've got those, those boots on the ground. DSP, I think we've covered it. Sweet. Okay. Sweet. Next time, it's always a pleasure, next, time, man. next time you're on, I'm going to talk to you about how to set up a new niche and a few other things that have come to mind. But uh, thanks so much for coming on. You're a legend. Hey, thanks, brother. It's always a pleasure to be on and uh, anytime. All right, Paul. Thank you. Take care. Massive thanks for DSP for coming on the podcast again. Um, I have it clear in my head, the, the process now that somebody sets up from scratch, especially uh, for an independent recruitment firm that doesn't have a lot of staff. And I really like the step-by-step model that, uh, that he discusses. Um, I would probably flip some of it on its head a little bit. I, I, I might bring in the content creation piece earlier in the process. Um, I find myself that when I look to take my business to the next level before, the bit that always held me back was the content creation. And doing this podcast has given me all of the content I really need to be able to chop that up and distribute it in the new year. And I'm, I'm kind of just figuring out that piece of my own puzzle right now. And I, I'm sure a lot of you will be right in there. And I know it's tough to get a content specialist to write in your own voice. Um, so I do agree with them that um, you should you should do your own content, but you could get somebody to edit it for you and you know, clean it up and turn it into something for you. you. You, it'll still be your voice. I believe so, anyway. Um, but hopefully that was helpful. He's a bit of a legend, and I'm sure some of you'll take some benefit from that. 
and be able to implement it in your own business. And if you want more details on it, uh, hit uh, hit DSP up on his uh, Facebook group. There's a ton of videos in there. He sells his own coaching service, but he gives away all the information for free. So, um, yeah, I would uh, I, I get a lot of benefit from these groups on Facebook. I'm sure you would too. All right, have a great weekend. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.